to uh, start with uh, what uh, what Michael finished with the um, to tell you about how I came to uh, write this uh, book and essentially is the content of uh, this lecture is uh, about three years ago I became aware that uh, in my medical lifetime uh, I had lived through uh, a golden age or the golden age of uh, cardiology and that I had uh, been an eyewitness in the sense that uh, I knew uh, the, the, at a personal level or a personal professional level, uh, m most of the people who made the great advances uh, in cardiology and that uh, most of them had uh, were no longer around to tell their story. And so if this story was going to be told, uh, I was in a particularly good position to uh, tell it. And uh, uh, when it was uh, published, I was delighted that it became uh, uh, briefly uh, the uh, a bestseller in its uh, category on Amazon. It was a number one uh, release for a while and got these uh, lovely uh, reviews. And it has now uh, just I see on Amazon has gone to its uh, second printing, I think possibly because uh, program uh, directors like uh, you at Oregon and uh, at Mayo and uh, uh, University of Miami, I'm aware of, uh, uh, have all uh, decided to uh, give the book as a present at graduation or uh, other times to their uh, fellows so that they can learn uh, the history of uh, their profession. And that's what I'm going to tell you about uh, this afternoon. So about a half century ago, uh, a little more than that now, uh, in, during World War II, with the discovery of antibiotics by Alexander uh, Fleming, uh, uh, heart disease emerged as our number one uh, killer. And as soldiers returned from World War II, uh, we had no heart surgery, no defibrillators, no pacemakers, very few drugs, no coronary care units. We were practicing medicine very much like this iconic uh, Norman Rockwell painting. We had a stethoscope and a lot of goodwill, but nothing to offer as an effective treatment for congenital heart disease, valvular heart disease, or coronary heart disease. And so the first great turning point in what has become our profession's golden age appeared actually in the midst of World War II. A, a wonderful irony in some, in some sense. Uh, this uh, man, uh, Dwight Harkin, he was an inexperienced 35-year-old Harvard surgeon, was appointed chief of thoracic surgery at the 160th General Hospital. It was a battlefield hospital uh, outside of uh, London. And I first met uh, Dwight some years later when I was a cardiology fellow at Harvard, and he was uh, the uh, chief of cardiac surgery. Uh, Dwight was a fascinating character. He was a fiery redhead with a temper to match. He was absolutely intimidating in the operating room. Uh, he reminded me of the, uh, the saying about uh, his contemporary, President uh, Roosevelt, uh, who was said to uh, want to be the the uh, bride at every wedding, the corpse at every funeral, and the baby at every christening. He was a person who dominated uh, his environment. And then it, it, coming out of the uh, operating room being a, a terror, he was the most charming uh, raconteur the, that you could uh, possibly meet. So I became very fond of Dwight, uh, despite uh, his his uh, uh, operating room uh, antics. And when uh, Dwight arrived in London, he encountered uh, a life that he had never seen before. And protruding from the hearts of his uh, young soldiers brought to him in the uh, operating room, shrapnel. Uh, protruding from the heart, swinging back and forth with each heartbeat uh, like a, an insolent metronome. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, Dwight was um, was quite aware of booming down through the centuries the voices of the great uh, Viennese surgeon Theodore Billroth, who said, "A surgeon who tries to suture a heart wound deserves to lose the esteem of his colleagues." And uh, England's great uh, surgeon said, "Surgery of the heart has reached the limits set by nature." No new method and no new discovery can overcome the difficulties that attend a wound of the heart. But it is said that a pile of rocks ceases to be a pile of rocks when a single man gazes on it, bearing within him the image of a cathedral. And that is precisely the description of what went on in Dwight Harkin's mind. He decided that he could save these surgeons, these uh, soldiers' uh, lives, and so he tried anyway. And what he did that was uh, innovative was he created a purse string around the, the shrapnel and then put his finger in the middle of the purse string, and then he uh, attached the hemostat to the shrapnel, and he yanked. And here's what happened. As he wrote to his wife in a letter uh, that night, and I have reproduced a portion uh, of it, he said, then suddenly, with a pop, as if a champagne cork had been drawn, the fragment jumped out of the ventricle, forced by the pressure within the chamber. Blood poured out in a torrent. I put my finger over the awful leak. The torrent slowed, stopped, and with my finger in situ, I took large needles swedged with silk and began passing them through the heart muscle wall under my finger and out the other side. With four of these in, I slowly removed my finger and, of course, tightened the purse string as one after another was tied. Blood pressure did drop. But the only moment of panic was when we discovered that one suture had gone through the glove of the finger that had stemmed the flood. I was sutured to the wall of the heart. We cut the glove and I got loose. Uh, imagine uh, Dwight Harkin's uh, feelings of ecstasy when he realized that he had uh, saved uh, this soldier's uh, life. And of course, uh, when he told us, uh, recounted this story to us uh, years later, uh, we sufferers of his uh, his uh, antics in the operating room said behind his back, well, he could have cut off the tip of his finger and got the same result. But uh, that was uh, Dwight Harkin. And uh, it was, to my mind, cardiac surgery is born in that moment when a maverick challenged conventional wisdom of uh, that time. Well, uh, what is a maverick? I like, uh, I like Steve Jobs' uh, definition. He said, here's to the misfits, the mavericks, the square pegs and the round holes. Uh, they don't care much for conventional wisdom. They challenge the rules. You can glorify them or you can vilify them, but you can't ignore them because they change things. And some will view them as crazy, but we view them, or I view them, as genius because the people who think they can change the world are the people who do. And that is the mavericks that uh, we will be meeting uh, in, this, uh, in this talk today. Now, in fairness, Harkin stood on the shoulders of other mavericks. There were certainly other men, as we heard in our previous lectures, who uh, also made contributions before uh, Dwight Harkin. Uh, and yet I would still give the uh, title of father of cardiac surgery to Dwight. Uh, Daniel Hale Williams was a black surgeon in the Midwest who sutured successfully a heart wound in 1893, but never did it again. Elliot Cutler was uh, Dwight's uh, mentor at the Brigham. Uh, and uh, did a successful procedure of mitral valvuloplasty, very similar to what Dwight would subsequently do, 
but uh, he had one success and then uh, 12 uh, deaths that followed and he gave up. Robert Gross and Alfred Blaylock both uh, did successful surgeries on the great vessels. Blaylock in particular, uh, the uh, the Blaylock Tausig uh, shunt, which you heard about uh, last week. But both of those, again, were not on the heart itself, but rather uh, on the great uh, vessels. And as an aside, if you have nothing to do tonight uh, and you uh, in this COVID epidemic uh, and uh, want to watch a great movie, watch something the Lord made. It is the story of uh, the uh, the Blaylock uh, Tausig shunt and the tremendous contribution made by Viv Vivian Thomas with a heart heart uh, rending uh, ending uh, to the uh, story of uh, Vivian Thomas and the recognition that he uh, deserved and ultimately received. Well, when Harkin came back, uh, he reported 134 cases of uh, repair and removal of foreign bodies from the uh, thoracic cavity, 16 of which were uh, from the beating heart itself. And in classic Harvard fashion, he began his article in the uh, American Heart Journal by quoting Aristotle, the heart alone of all viscera cannot sustain serious injury, and then uh, quoted Stephen Paget, uh, as I uh, showed you, and then proceeded to demolish them in uh, with subsequent uh, pictures uh, and uh, text showing how he had uh, succeeded. We'll notice also that Paul Zoll, who was one of the originators of pacemakers, was his uh, colleague uh, in those uh, days in uh, London. But the, the critics replied when he published this in the American Heart Journal, well, uh, and one of them was uh, Lord Brock of, uh, of London. Men in Boston, Dwight, uh, uh, and in London, don't get shrapnels in their hearts. So congratulations on your accomplishment, but it really has uh, not, uh, not, not a great advance in terms of relevance. But uh, when he returned to Boston, Dwight uh, had a different uh, vision. He had the cathedral in his mind. And that set up one of the fascinating battles of, uh, of uh, early uh, golden era of cardiology. Harvard's uh, Dwight Harkin uh, versus Philadelphia's Charlie Bailey. Uh, the uh, Celtics uh, versus the 76ers, the Patriots versus uh, the Eagles, the uh, the Cradle of Liberty versus the, the, the Home of the Liberty Bell. And Dwight Harkin from Harvard was the silk stocking academic elite, uh, wonderfully ingratiating in uh, meeting the public. Charlie Bailey was his precise opposite. He was a Jersey hardscrabble kid raised as a by a single parent. His father had died from mitral stenosis in his early 40s, coughing blood into a basin, uh, as, his, as he described. And he had a messianic drive to defeat mitral stenosis. And he was a really confrontational guy. He loved getting into arguments. I imagine that this is the closest uh, that Charlie Bailey ever came to actually smiling, and they captured it in this photo. And the two of them then set out with this idea that they would create a purse string suture in the left atrium, insert their finger through that uh, purse string suture, and with a blade on the end of their finger, would use that blade to separate the fused commissures of the mitral valve. And uh, relative to what uh, Lori Armsby uh, asked in uh, the fascinating question she asked uh, in last week's uh, lecture, here is what Dwight Harkin uh, had to say about the, uh, the conundrum of operating when you don't know what's going to happen and there is an extraordinarily high risk. Dwight Harkin said, when you face a diagnosis that is absolute and a condition that is incurable, if you have any rational concept of how to attack it, you have the right to try. I want you to just look at that for a second, and because I'm going to ask you at the end, uh, do you agree with Dwight Harkin's point of view, or don't you? 
and I'll tell you my opinion uh, as well. Uh, between them, uh, Dwight Harkin, over a period of two years, uh, Dwight Harkin and uh, Charlie Bailey operated on 10 consecutive patients. Every one of them died, not one survivor. Now, uh, uh, taking uh, Lori's question again, were they unethical to continue? Well, Bailey, by that time, he had begun with privileges at five Philadelphia hospitals. By then, uh, he had been barred from three hospitals for his mortalities. The, uh, the uh, sobriquet Butcher Bailey echoed through the halls, uh, muttered by his uh, nurses uh, for uh, his mortalities. And so he, in true Charlie Bailey fashion, scheduled two patients with mitral stenosis on the same day at the two hospitals in which he continued to have uh, privileges. And uh, at Philadelphia General, the first patient died during anesthesia induction before he ever started the operation. The, uh, the patient's uh, family doc was there and Charlie agreed to, uh, after they resuscitated him, agreed to go ahead provided that the patient had been declared dead so that he could not be uh, blamed for the patient's death. The patient did die uh, during the procedure. And so he stripped off his gloves and raced across town, uh, hoping, I suppose, that the car was faster than the telephone and operated on the uh, lady at Episcopal Hospital. And his surgery was dramatically successful. She was walking around the uh, the uh, halls on the third day, and uh, at the a little after a week, he put her on a train to Chicago and took her to the uh, Society of Thoracic Surgery, where he introduced her to the uh, to the assembled multitude of thoracic uh, surgeons. And after ten hospital deaths, Charlie Bailey appeared on the cover of Time magazine, and Dwight Harkin who succeeded uh, in the same week that uh, Charlie Bailey had succeeded, was elected president of the American College of Cardiology. What a fascinating uh, uh, idea about society's ethical paradox. Before the success, clearly the operation was considered unethical. Uh, doctors at Bailey's Hospital were uh, lobbying for him to have his medical, his license to practice medicine withdrawn. And after the success, it clearly was a laudable undertaking. Well, now that they had uh, broken that barrier, surgeons wanted open heart surgery, but that presented three new problems. You had to arrest the heart, arrest and restart the heart. You had to recirculate, you had to circulate blood during cardiac arrest and you had to oxygenate the blood. And nobody at that time had uh, found a way to oxygenate, deoxygenated blood. So which way to go? Well, uh, in Alice in Wonderland, uh, she says, if you don't know where you're going, almost any route will do. And so some uh, any routes were uh, found. And the first op successful open heart surgery was an ASD repair done in six minutes under hypothermia, a fantastic race to, play, to place sutures uh, fast enough before there was uh, brain damage. And that was done as uh, you heard last week by John Lewis, an assistant at that operation was Walt Lillyhigh. And we will uh, focus on uh, Walt, who uh, was a veteran of the uh, military campaign in uh, Africa. On the last day of his surgical residency, he uh, was diagnosed as having lymphosarcoma of the parotid gland. His boss, Owen Wangenstein, uh, operated to remove it and dissected down into the mediastinum, gave him a 5% projected five-year survival. Lily High was a paradox to me, I think, and everyone else. He basically had two personalities. In the hospital, he was absolutely admirable, diligent, dedicated, sensitive to patients, physician, you would have uh, greatly admired him. Outside the hospital, he cared uh, very little for the norms of society. Uh, he uh, was an iconoclast. He drank, he caroused. He lived like there was no tomorrow, perhaps 
because of his uh, his uh, medical diagnosis. And I believe that these two traits, his challenging to of conventional wisdom and his uh, sensitivity of as a as a physician, came together in his uh, creative genius. What Walt recognized was that the problem with hypothermia was that you could only operate on ASDs because everything else within the every other kind of heart surgery within the heart would take at least uh, ten minutes and uh, was precluded by use of hypothermia. And so he came up with this brilliant intuition. I wonder if any of you, I doubt that I would have uh, thought of it, uh, and that it is this, this insight, that a mother's body supports a fetus within the body. Why not uh, a child when the child is outside the body? And he came up with the idea of cross-circulation, essentially connect the parent's uh, circulation uh, with the child and keep the child alive during surgery that way. And you heard about that last week. Uh, and um, when he did that, when he came up with that idea and announced his intention, that put him in an enormous conflict uh, with uh, Cecil Watson, Minnesota's principal's chief, uh, principal chief of medicine, who uh, memorably uh, opposed uh, Lily High and said, for the first time in history, a surgeon may have a 200% mortality, 100% for the child who dies, and he'll, he can kill off uh, the donor as well. Uh, and uh, uh, really, I uh, heard uh, Watson's uh, complaint and paid not a bit of care to it and went ahead and really high succeeded on his second try and when he did, he again ignored conventional uh, of uh, society at that time. He held a press conference in the auditorium where he uh, invited all the uh, reporters, and he handed out uh, brochures, essentially uh, uh, papers describing uh, the procedure itself. He gave a little lecture, and then as his pièce de résistance, he wheeled in little Pamela with her parents, uh, and there is uh, Pamela as cute as a button. And uh, by the time uh, the parents finished describing how sick she had appeared before she was now looking so healthy, there was not a dry eye in the audience. The old gray lady, the New York Times, gushed, impossible surgery now done. Pamela was chosen Minnesota and American Heart Association's Queen of Hearts. She had a picture spread of uh, six pages in Cosmopolitan magazine, and Lily High gained admirers around the world and further infuriated Cecil Watson. And, and what that shows us, I think, is another trait of the Mavericks that, uh, that have driven our uh, golden era of cardiology, and that is they think outside the box. Uh, how uh, remarkable. Uh, Lily High's original thought. And then uh, Lily High, having proven the feasibility now of open heart surgery, came the single most awful moment in all my years of attending medical meetings. When uh, in December of that year at the American Society of Thoracic Surgery uh, meetings, as he presented uh, the uh, results of cross circulation. Somebody from the back of the room yelled, Admit that you have a vegetable in the hospital. And it was true. Geraldine Thompson, a uh, mother of four, had suffered uh, an air embolus during the cross circulation procedure and emerged uh, from that event. Uh, essentially unable to take care of her children. And uh, cross-circulation really died that day in the minds of most surgeons and cardiologists. Uh, Lily High did continue to do them for a while, but essentially Lily High's success with cross-circulation was led to John Gibbons' development of the heart-lung machine. And let me tell you now the incredible story of John Gibbon and his heart-lung machine. 
he was uh, different from all the rest. He was a Philadelphia patrician. He was a fifth generation physician. He had a home on the main line where he put on uh, fabulous parties in the house near uh, and a, another lodging near Pennsylvania Hospital where he uh, worked. He was more or less uh, coerced into going into medicine by his uh, family ties because he uh, really was an artistic and sensitive man who would have preferred to be a poet. But he, uh, uh, after he got to uh, Harvard in uh, medical school in uh, subsequent uh, years, he got involved in trying to create a heart-lung machine. And he spent 22 years of dedicated research trying to develop a heart-lung machine. He got as far as being able to keep a cat alive for a period of time on a machine, but uh, was really unable to solve the problem of oxygenation effectively. And through his social contacts, he met uh, uh, Watson, uh, Thomas Watson of International uh, Business Machines, who was fascinated with the idea and sent five of his engineers to Philadelphia to work with uh, Gibbon on developing a method of oxygenation that could be uh, incorporated into his heart-lung machine. And they succeeded. And uh, on his second try, uh, John Gibbon had a, a successful uh, ASD closure with, uh, it took him 26 minutes to do it. He was a rather indifferent, uh, talented uh, surgeon. You remember that uh, Louis High and Lewis closed theirs in uh, six minutes. Uh, and, uh, and uh, so that was the great technological uh, breakthrough. He used the machine uh, twice more on uh, children, uh, and uh, both of them died. And so incredibly, at the age of 49, at the peak of his uh, surgical powers and his enormous contribution to surgery, he stopped using the heart-lung machine and would never use it again. But uh, the door had been opened a crack, and through that uh, crack in the door, the incandescent light of possibility uh, was apparent to others. And uh, none more than this man, uh, who uh, saw the capability of transitioning from congenital heart disease to valvular heart disease. The University of Oregon's pioneering surgeon the father of valve, valvular heart surgery, Al Starr. And Al uh, was a prodigy, prodigy, no doubt. He graduated from uh, Columbia University at the age of 19. He uh, interned uh, with, uh, with uh, Albert Blaylock at Hopkins, the developer of, uh, the, developer of the uh, Blaylock-Towsing the procedure, Blaylock-Towsing-Thomas procedure at Hopkins. And probably that's where he uh, decided to become a heart surgeon. He was only 31 when uh, he went back to New York and was at Bellevue when he was recruited, allegedly by uh, the temptation of salmon fishing, as well as the temptation to start uh, Oregon's heart surgery program to the University of Oregon. And there, uh, about a year later, he met retired engineer Lowell Edwards, who came to see him. Uh, Edwards uh, had early Parkinson's disease. He was a, also a very creative man. And uh, Edwards wanted to uh, try to create a, an artificial heart. And Al Starr said, no, uh, let's make instead an artificial heart valve. And together they, after a number of uh, design failures, they came up with this uh, valve. Uh, so-called ball in cage. Every time uh, the uh, heart beat, the ball would pop forward to be trapped by these uh, by these uh, prongs, and then fall back again as uh, flow uh, diminished. It's a very lar loud uh, valve. You could actually hear it outside the uh, chest wall. And uh, after a while, he had a uh, dog lab uh, with a bunch of dogs walking around with these. Uh, valves clacking away when uh, when um, Henry Griswold, who was chief of medicine, came and said, hey, I got a patient over here uh, who could uh, 
uh, use one of those vowels. And so uh, a little in advance of uh, when he had planned to do it, Alstar agreed to uh, to uh, operate on uh, the lady. And on his uh, second heart valve replacement, he had a brilliant success. The lady was up, awake, and feeling good on the first post-operative day. Uh, it was a, a technical uh, success. And uh, when uh, uh, he came in to uh, see her, she said, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable uh, here, uh, having lay in this uh, same position for so long. Could you help me move? And as he helped her move to a different position, she had a sudden death. And it turned out that she had died from an air embolus. And uh, it was, of course, not known at that time, the risk of uh, air embolus. And uh, Al vowed, and I understand that it never happened, that it would never happen again to him, and it never did. It is a, a, uh, uh, an anomaly of early uh, heart surgery and led to uh, people being operated in the uh, Trendelenburg uh, position. Uh, Al's uh, surgery, like uh, Lily High's, had a 50% mortality in the uh, first year, but uh, with, uh, with the rapid learning curve uh, of uh, valve surgery, it fell rapidly uh, so that by uh, the time I uh, uh, became, I was entering uh, cardiology uh, a decade or so uh, later, uh, it had fallen to the range of 5% mortality, and uh, today about 200,000 valve surgeries are the outcome of Al Starr's pioneering uh, work, the father of valve surgery. I, uh, Al was also a, a professional friend of my mentor, uh, Jeremy Swan, because both of them were consultants to Edwards Laboratories. In addition to uh, to valve surgery, uh, the heart-lung machine fathered the technologic breakthrough to transplant surgery. Norm Shumway, probably my favorite cardiac surgeon of uh, all of them, uh, he trained with uh, Lily High. He spent eight years perfecting the technique of uh, animal cardiac transplantation, beginning with autotransplant and all the, all the methodology necessary for that. And when he was ready to try it in humans, the lawyers at Stanford blocked it because they were afraid of, of uh, uh, lawsuits. And so a, uh, another trainee of Lily High's, Christian Bernard, came through, uh, saw uh, uh, the methodology, and went back to Brutur in South Africa, where he did not face similar uh, legal obstacles. And I recall in 1969, waking up on a Sunday morning, to the news that the first heart transplant had been done. Uh, uh, there was an enormous difference between a self-effacing, good-natured, funny Norm Shumway and attention-grabbing, good-looking, uh, and uh, 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 Christian Bernard, who spent much of his time with uh, beautiful women that he met. Here he is. He had a torrid love affair with Gina Lola Brigida, the uh, Italian sex symbol of that uh, era. And here he is with uh, Sophia Loren, uh, whom he dated uh, a number of times. Uh, what followed uh, was uh, Christian Bernard uh, uh, only operated uh, nine times on transplants uh, in his entire uh, career. He was not much admired in the United States. Uh, following that uh, announcement, uh, there were 99 transplants in the next year. All patients essentially died in the uh, post-operative period. And three years later, there were only three pro transplant programs uh, left. Uh, some, some way uh, continued on, soldiered on, and in the tortoise and the hare story of cardiology, solved the problem of rejection, which had uh, uh, dog transplantation 11 years later. Uh, with Sandoz, with the development of cyclosporin, and uh, this really is a um, is a a blot on the uh, history of uh, cardiology. Our uh, I think our uh, rush to judgment to uh, cardiac uh, transplant, and uh, Lily High biographer Wayne uh, Miller, I think quite appropriately says that cardiac surgery. He actually titles one of the chapters of his book. Uh, 
about uh, Louis Hyde. Uh, says cardiac surgery was born on a river of blood. So uh, that is uh, the story of, of uh, the great advance in our profession, for which we can have great pride, but we have to uh, recognize that it wasn't perfect. Now, the complications of pediatric heart surgery fathered modern electrophysiology. This man, uh, Claude Beck in uh, Cleveland, was operating on a young uh, man with a pectus uh, uh, at the bottom, when uh, the, as he was closing up, the uh, boy uh, developed ventricular fibrillation. And uh, at that time, there was no treatment. The patient was essentially dead. But he was aware that the uh, famed uh, electrophysiologist, famed uh, physiologist Carl Wiggers, had uh, begun work in a nearby laboratory in uh, Cleveland uh, studying defibrillators. And so he demanded that Wiggers. Uh, animal uh, laboratory defibrillator he brought to his operating room. He uh, got the uh, defibrillator after he stood for about uh, 45 minutes to an hour with uh, pumping the young man's uh, heart, uh, squeezing it uh, uh, rhythmically to uh, keep him uh, alive. And then uh, the uh, when the uh, device arrived, he wiped off the paddles uh, to make sure that uh, no infection would be transmitted applied them uh, to the boy's heart. And on the second shot, shock, the uh, heart returned to uh, sinus rhythm. And imagine the feeling that, that uh, Claude Beck must have felt in that moment. Mankind's uh, dream of recitation, resuscitation from death, the dream of uh, Lazarus in the Bible, finally uh, realized after uh, uh, two millennia. Uh, Beck's uh, experience led to the development of cardiac defibrillators, and he was, here is uh, one of the, the early uh, Beck's uh, defibrillator. He became so enamored with this that he demanded that uh, all the uh, surgeons in his uh, training program carry a, a scalpel in their uh, uh, pocket, and uh, whenever a person had a cardiac arrest, they were to slash open the chest of uh, the patient and uh, attempt defibrillation, which he had done uh, soon after this experience in the operating room in an outpatient who had come uh, and uh, had a cardiac arrest while uh, waiting to see him. He slashed right through the patient's shirt, opened up the uh, chest, squeezed on the uh, heart until the defibrillator arrived. And uh, the man uh, survived uh, for many years thereafter. Uh, and so uh, there was a period of a couple of years where slashing open chest for manual uh, massage uh, followed. I lived through that uh, period. And I remember uh, Richard Ross, uh, uh, who was chief of cardiology at Hopkins, uh, liked to uh, relate an apocryphal story. He said, you know, I uh, one day I fainted and uh, uh, I woke up and here was the cardiac surgeon poised over me with a scalpel in his hand. And I was having uh, trouble with... Uh, my uh, cardiac uh, surgeon at uh, Cedars uh, over a kind of a turf war. And I said to uh, Richard, well, you know, the same thing happened to me, except I hadn't fainted. And so uh, anyway, that was a, a period in cardiology that has uh, since passed. The other surgical uh, disaster that, uh, that was uh, the impetus to electrophysiology was heart block. And that caused about 20% of uh, Walt Lilly High's mortalities. Again, we had no treatment for heart block. And so uh, he uh, looked around for a, for a solution, and he saw that there was a repairman who would come and pick up uh, hospital equipment and take it back to his Minnesota garage to uh, repair it. This is, Walt, uh, this is uh, Earl Bakken in his Minnesota uh, garage. And he uh, explained his problem to... Earl Bakken. This is Earl in those uh, years. This is Earl as I uh, came to know him uh, years later uh, at his uh, home in Hawaii. I had uh, dinner and lunch with him many times uh, and heard him recount the stories of uh, that era. Uh, Earl went back and got himself a transistor, uh, one of those newfangled transistors, and a metronome and connected them up and created a pacemaker. And then uh, when he had it uh, working, 
He came back to Walt Whitley High, showed it to him. They, the two of them walked into the operating room. Uh, nobody said anything. They connected it up. It worked. And uh, there you are. Uh, we had uh, uh, within uh, a few months, uh, Walt Lily High now appearing on the cover of Post Magazine with this child and the first uh, of the external Medtronic external cardiac uh, pacemakers, uh, the beginning of the pacemaker uh, era. And here is the garage that uh, housed uh, Medtronic for a few years until they almost went bankrupt. Uh, they they had a company, but they they uh, uh, until they got uh, more corporate funding, they almost went bankrupt. And here is uh, uh, Medtronic as uh, I visited it as a visiting uh, professor uh, there, invited uh, to a lecture uh, some years later. Now, the uh, leading, uh, the beginning of the medical device industry and the uh, leader in that field uh, with 41,000 employees, and then at that time, an annual uh, revenue of $15 billion. Lily High, uh, the most uh, heralded surgeon of his era, moved on to Cornell when he wasn't offered chief of, uh, of, cardio of uh, surgery at Minnesota. And uh, Earl Bakken retired uh, to Hawaii, where he lived an idyllic uh, life. And uh, this leads us to the Greek tragedy of Walt Lilly High, where his strength became his uh, weakness. He uh, didn't file uh, uh, an income tax return for a couple of years. Uh, no, the IRS noticed that, and so they challenged him and he paid. But then, amazingly, he didn't file for another three years, and that tends to irritate the IRS considerably. And uh, so they decided to make a showcase out of America's most famous uh, surgeon. And they, in inspecting his uh, finances, they found that he had failed to declare $250,000 of income from 318 patients, that he had further that he had uh, taken his patient, his uh, parents' anniversary party and deducted it as a business expense, and that he had uh, employed a Las Vegas prostitute uh, and and uh, and deducted her uh, expenses as a, a secretarial expense. They called her into uh, his trial, and uh, she uh, testified that her area of expertise was not really uh, secretarial services. And then as the final blow, they showed that uh, some of his records, which he kept on little index cards, had been altered with a, a different ink than the original ink. And so uh, Walt Lilly High was convicted in court by uh, a jury of his peers in New York, uh, fined uh, uh, the, the judge, uh, in the trial, uh, find him, but could not bring himself to send this flawed genius to uh, jail. I think that was probably appropriate because the he realized that Walt it, Lily High was about to be completely ostracized by society. He was forced to step down from his position of ch chief at New York uh, Cornell. He went back to Minnesota where when he went to the university uh, club, people would come up to the table where he was sitting and greet his wife, Kay, and completely ignore him. Uh, his Minnesota medical license uh, was revoked. And of course, the visiting professorships and honors that he had uh, received over the years uh, completely uh, disappeared. This is Walt as uh, I knew him. Uh, he. Uh, his head is, uh, he's bald and his head is tilted over to one side by scarring from the mediastinal uh, dissection. Uh, wonderful sense of humor, very likable uh, person. Uh, he actually reminded me, uh, as you can see from this picture, a little of, uh, of E.T. And uh, I always kind of thought of him that way in, in my uh, own experience. Well, this brings us to the most poignant moment in uh, American cardiology uh, when uh, John Kirkland, his uh, competitor about eight years younger at Mayo Clinic, uh, was elected uh, 
uh, president of the American Society of Thoracic Surgery. And in his inaugural speech, he spotted Walt in the audience. And he stopped his speech and uh, pointed to Walt and said, he was and still is a great hero of mine, one of cardiology, cardiac surgery's greatest innovators. Dear colleagues, may I depart from my text to ask this pioneering uh, surgeon to stand to your applause. Walt Lillyhigh, may we see you. And Walt stood to the applause of a thousand hands. And in my mind, he was in that moment uh, redeemed. And he then became the medical director of St. Jude's Hospital, uh, uh, St. Jude's uh, 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 Corporation. And uh, this is Walt at age 30 with his uh, lovely uh, wife who put up with uh, Kay, who put up with uh, all his shenanigans over all those years. Here is uh, at his 80th birthday party, the man who I believe would have won the Nobel Prize for cross circulation. He also developed a bubble oxygenator that was widely used. His contributions to the development of the cardiac, uh, external cardiac pacemaker. And at Walt's 80th birthday, who was there to help him celebrate? Little uh, Pamela, the girl who he had operated on uh, at the beginning of uh, that era. Well, now cardiac surgeons were desperate for one more technology. And that brings us to the strangest story in the history of, uh, of I think, in the history of medicine certainly in the history of cardiology. 29-year-old internal medicine resident, uh, Werner Forsman in a hospital outside of about an hour north of uh, Berlin in 1929, came up with the idea that if you could pass a tube into the heart uh, chambers themselves, you could more effectively deliver medication. And so he went to his uh, boss and proposed to pass a, uh, a tube into the heart, and he was uh, roundly rejected with a Teutonic certainty by his boss. But his boss failed to realize that uh, uh, Werner Forsman had a particular advantage. He was a good looking internal medicine resident in a sea of nubile nurses, and he uh, romanced nurse Gerda Dertsen, uh, Ditson to uh, participate with him. She became uh, smitten with him and his idea, and together, and she unlocked the supply cabinet. She had the keys. Uh, they grabbed a urinary bladder catheter, and they went to a remote area of the hospital where she, he strapped her down. Uh, and uh, then, uh, was he really going to uh, catheterize her to prove his point? No, he then catheterized himself, and together they walked through the halls down to the basement uh, of the uh, hospital, uh, with this catheter d dangling from his arm like a serpent in a horror movie. And he got this x-ray, which demonstrates that he had indeed catheterized the uh, right atrium. And uh, for that, he was uh, denied cardiology posts throughout Germany. He was considered a little crazy, but he had uh, uh, published his uh, animal laboratory and uh, this image in... Uh, the leading medical journal of Germany, and 10 years later, two U.S. physicians, uh, Forsman uh, uh, and Conan, uh, used cardiac catheterization in U.S. soldiers to treat cardiogenic shock. They also obtained images of the heart. And uh, in the mid-1950s, these three doctors, uh, Conan, Forsman, and, uh, and Richards, uh, won the Nobel Prize. risk takers. And that leads us to the second great paradigm shift in uh, cardiology uh, and the most unforgettable character that I ever met, which is Mason Soans, shown here. He was a, a short uh, guy, kind of pudgy, uh, with glasses. He was a sartorial disaster. He uh, cursed like a so sailor and he uh, I one uh, He, he uh, appeared at uh, meetings from time to time 
really intoxicated. He was an irrepressible soul. He delighted in uh, shocking people. He was very much beloved by uh, people, uh, despite his, uh, or perhaps because of his irrepressibility. He, in the in the cat lab, he kept a lit. He was a uh, chain smoker, and then he kept a lit cigarette in a sterile forceps. So he give a puff of dye, and then they take a puff on his a cigarette back and forth. And while he was doing an aortic root uh, angiogram one day in his cath lab, the catheter tip flipped directly. It was a power injection flipped directly into the right coronary artery as he injected the dye. And here is the world's first selective coronary angiogram, that image uh, that uh, Mason Soane obtained. Uh, the uh, conventional wisdom did decreed that this would be fatal because the dye would clog up the coronary arteries and uh, cardiac arrest would follow. And Soane uh, then stood stunned as the heart stopped. But of course, as we well know, after a few seconds, it started up again. He had witnessed the first selective coronary angiogram. Now, did Mason fall to his knees and thank the good Lord for his beneficence? No. What Mason did was he... Uh, finished the procedure, stripped, stripped off his gloves, walked back to the uh, office and bellowed for all to hear, I just revolutionized uh, cardiology. And uh, to which it is said that his long-suffering uh, secretary, Elaine Clayton, looked up from her typing and said to him, again? And uh, that was uh, Mason uh, Soames. Well, coronary angiography, revealed our mortal enemy, the atheroma, but it didn't treat it. And that then fell to this man, uh, Rene Favaloro, a fascinating uh, guy who was born and raised in the Pampas. He was very bright. He was number one in his class in, uh, in medical school, but he was a uh, outspoken opponent of the uh, Peronista government. And he was essentially uh, banned by the government to return to the Pampas in rural practice, and he uh, was outstanding there, but he strived, he, he, he wanted to accomplish more than that. And so at age 39, he uh, gave up his practice and came to the United States uh, with no job, but a, a letter of, in, of, uh, of uh, introduction to uh, Donna Effler at the Cleveland Clinic, who gave him a job as a cardiac surgery technician in the animal lab. It became uh, quite apparent very soon that uh, uh, Favaloro was enormously talented. And uh, soon th after a while, uh, uh, Effler uh, uh, gave him a, a, cardiolo a cardiac surgery fellowship. And during that period, he then studied with Soane's uh, at night going over coronary angiograms. And uh, Rene Favaloro was uh, the most focused on moral principles of any physician uh, I know. I tell you much more about it in the book, and if you uh, it, you will see what a principled man uh, he was, an enormously admirable individual. And then in 1967, without having ever done any animal laboratory studies, he succeeded in relieving uh, angina in a patient with by doing a coronary artery bypass surgery. Uh, Soans uh, showed that the, the vessel was open, and that was the beginning. He, uh, in the next three years, did over a 1,000 procedures. <clears throat> he was offered millions of dollars to uh, go to Miami to set up an institution there, and he declined, instead returned uh, home to create in his uh, own country, Argentina, uh, the Funda Fundacion uh, Favaloro. He was a – it was the Cleveland Clinic – of South America. And during uh, Argentina's economic collapse in 2000, due largely to corruption, uh, the, fund the foundation fell into $15 million debt. He, debt. he was uh, devastated. And on uh, Sunday morning in 2000, I can recall hearing this uh, also. He walked into his bathroom. corruption that had engulfed uh, him and the uh, foundation. Uh, a wonderful uh, surgeon and a wonderful man. Well, the technology from surgery came together in a way that no one could possibly have uh, anticipated in the uh, coronary care unit. 
And uh, genius, uh, it is said, is seeing what uh, everyone has seen and thinking what no one else has thought. And if that's true, uh, let's give a plaudit to Jeremy Swan, who one day sitting on the beach in Santa Monica uh, saw uh, sailboats carried by uh, gusts of wind and came up with the idea that you could create a catheter with uh, sheets and sails and uh, it could be carried uh, through the circulation so that we could measure at the bedside uh, uh, cardiac hemodynamics. He conceived of the catheter uh, and uh, uh, while consulting at Edwards, someone came up with the idea of replacing the sails with a, a balloon. Willie Gans, by great serendipity, arrived at Cedars from Czechoslovakia uh, uh, and uh, brought with him a method for measuring cardiac output. And we put those two together in a catheter that allows us to measure both uh, wedge pressure and uh, cardiac output. And because Jeremy and Willie neither uh, ever used the uh, catheters in a human being, uh, it fell to George Diamond, my, uh, my fellow George and I, to uh, do all the clinical studies in the uh, coronary care unit. And our great insight, uh, which was, came uh, to be called the uh, Forrester classification, was that when we measured pulmonary capillary pressure with the catheter and cardiac index, we had surrogate measurements of the starlight fun function curve of diastolic volume and stroke volume. And therefore we could draw, uh, if we, Oh, Dr. Forrester, if you can hear us, we're, we've lost you a little bit. It's cut out before. You might need to restart once we can hear you again. We also saw that that uh, uh, allowed us to uh, create four clinical subsets, which are now taught as warm, dry, uh, wet, and uh, cold. And in that uh, time, then, uh, George and I and uh, my fellows defined the bedside hemodynamic effects of all the cardiac drugs in acute myocardial infarction. And uh, in that uh, period of time, then hospital mortality in the CCU with all these advances fell well, from 30% to 15%. Of course, it's now down to 5%. And uh, when I interviewed uh, Gene Brownwald about coronary care unit a couple of years ago, uh, he said it was the greatest advance uh, in, uh, in uh, of, of that era. Um, to uh, finish up, uh, let's go to uh, the third great paradigm shift, which was Andreas Grunzig, handsome as a, as a Errol Flynn, uh, whom his uh, research nurses compared him to, spent five years in a Zurich kitchen trying to develop a method to open up coronary artery stenoses. Uh, he finally did develop a method, brought his animal laboratory data, the American Heart Association meetings in in 1976, he was completely ignored, went back to Zurich and uh, uh, performed the procedure on this man, Adolf Bachman, Bachman who is still alive today. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that was the birth of uh, coronary angioplasty. When he came back to present it the year later, 1977, uh, he, the first time I've ever seen it, received a standing ovation when he presented uh, his abstract. Uh, Grunzig teaches us that Mavericks use failure as fuel. He failed and failed and failed until he succeeded. But uh, Andreas became uh, something, uh, uh, sadly, uh, perhaps a modern Icarus. He uh, uh, divorced his uh, first wife after he uh, recruited to uh, Emory uh, and uh, married uh, this uh, lovely uh, lady, uh, Margaret Ann uh, Thornton and uh, bought a, a wonderful mansion in uh, Atlanta where he uh, staged uh, lavish parties. He bought his own plane and uh, a cottage in Sea Island, which is about an hour south of Atlanta. And in uh, 1985, while flying back from Sea Island during Hurricane Juan, something that only uh, Andreas would have imagined that he could uh, do, he got completely disoriented uh, and ended up flying uh, southeast rather than northwest and crashed into a Georgia cornfield outside of uh, Macon. 
<coughs> at um, 300 miles an hour, the, arguably the greatest cardiology of uh, our uh, era, uh, dying in his uh, mid 40s. Uh, it is for uh, you in Oregon, it's worth knowing that the father of angioplasty actually was Oregon's crazy Charlie daughter. He was a uh, radiologist, Walt Lilly High. He skipped a grade. Uh, he uh, was named uh, chair of radiology at Oregon at the age of 32, the youngest in the country. He created a balloon catheter before Jeremy Swan. He opened blood vessels before Grunzig. And he here is an example of he uh, wedged open uh, blood vessels here. Notice that this stenosis right here is completely uh, relieved. Uh, this is the patient that uh, he did it in. Uh, the the uh, device, the, uh, the patient was sent to him with this note. It says, uh, open, but do not uh, fix. The surgeon didn't want him to fix it. And uh, Charlie, of course, went right ahead and fixed it. And then took that patient with him to, uh, to Mount Rainier the next year. Uh, here they are standing uh, on the uh, top of uh, Rainier, and he would show this sequence whenever uh, he lectured to the great uh, dismay of the vascular surgeons. So where does all this uh, creativity that happened uh, leave us today? Well, uh, perhaps it's that everything can be invented, uh, that can be invented, has been invented. Uh, what can we learn from uh, this, uh, this experience? Well, um, uh, this dog, I think, perhaps has learned the uh, saying from Einstein, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, uh, uh, don't expect a different result. You've got to get outside the box, you know, stop running around in circles, come up with an entirely new idea. And if you persist and persist and persist, uh, perhaps you will ultimately, uh, like Grunzig, uh, seize the prize, and if you do, you can be pretty darn proud of your accomplishment, and you will deserve a uh, a pat on the head. So uh, the past, as uh, Michael has told us, informs the present and the future. Here's here's uh, uh, Harkin's uh, hand leading to Star's valve, leading to my. Uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Pribier's uh, valve for uh, Taver. Oh, here's uh, uh, three generations. Uh, me, Alain Pribier, uh, a research fellow in our program back in the uh, day, and now uh, his uh, uh, trainee, uh, uh, Raj Makar, who has the largest volume uh, in the uh, United States for a uh, taver. Going back, to here's a uh, here is Bex defibrillator. Here's Lily High's uh, pacemaker, and now the pacemakers that we are implanting in uh, Cedars today, uh, and uh, soon we'll have, I hope, uh, implantable defibrillator. Swan's balloon. A leading to an implantable device that gives the same measurements. And now on the horizon, a device that creates an atrial septal defect that relieves elevated wedge pressure or elevated uh, uh, right atrial pressure and pulmonary congestion has a great promise of markedly reducing hospitalizations for heart failure. Charlie Dodder's uh, wedging uh, balloon, uh, wedging catheters leading to Brunswick's uh, balloon catheter leading to stents and hopefully one day stents that dissolve uh, spontaneously. People the same as uh, devices. So the greatest medical uh, achievement of our times, I would submit that uh, our golden age of cardiology at least deserves consideration. I'm tremendously excited by the development of cardiac surgery and cardiac transplantation, pacemakers and defibrillators, angiography and angioplasty, and now uh, preventive cardiology. And uh, I am uh, jumping up and down about valve replacement and repair without surgery now and in the future, wireless pacemakers and defibrillators, biodegradable stents, cardiac regeneration uh, with stem cells, and possibly in the future, a uh, transplantable uh, animal heart. 
I hope you have felt the uh, same uh, experience and that uh, uh, you would uh, join with me in uh, feeling that uh, we are indeed passing the baton uh, of, of uh, to a new generation of Mavericks. And that is why the past is prologue in the golden age of cardiology. So thanks so much for inviting me to uh, participate in this uh, Kasdan uh, lectureship.